Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Zeph and I Plus. Uh, if you're watching us at home, we are delighted to have you with us, and we, we thank you for joining us, and uh, we hope this is blessing your life. We're now in class number two. We started it last week, and uh, we're going to be covering 15 verses of Zephaniah today in chapter one of Zephaniah. In fact, we're going to bring Zephaniah chapter one to a close today. And uh, just a, an administrative point, I won't be here next week. I'm going to be gone on, uh, on a trip. Um, Deb and I are heading for Tennessee next week. Uh, Pastor Dean will be in here teaching, and he will be teaching on the Gospel of John. So I hope you'll all join him next week. I will be back the following week on August 13th, and uh, we'll be doing Zephaniah class number three on August 13th. So look forward to seeing you all back then as well. Those of you watching at home, uh, that probably won't be on next week, but we'll be on the following week. So, where we left it last week, we talked about, we kind of set the sta the standing of what the world looked like in Zephaniah's time. And I want to go back and just cover a few things from that, because we're going to continue into that, into that mode today. We're looking at the kingdom of Judah. Remember, after Solomon died, Israel split into two parts. The northern kingdom, which was called Israel at that time, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah at that time. Israel went way off the rails early and ended up getting destroyed by God in uh, 721 BC. Um, but Judah remained pr pretty close to God during that period. Judah had some good kings and some bad kings. Uh, during the early part, they had more good kings than bad kings, but later on, they had more bad kings than good kings. And we talked about Hezekiah was one of the really good kings, probably the best king that Judah ever had. Hezekiah ruled for about 40 years. He died in 697 BC, and Hezekiah brought Israel back to God during his time. And as a result of that, God was willing to go out and destroy 185,000 Assyrian soldiers that were arrayed around Jerusalem, just about ready to destroy Jerusalem. Um, that was how much good leadership works in this world. Hezekiah was a good leader, and he brought his country to God. And we look around us in the world today, and we say, gosh, you know, where are the Hezekiahs in our world? Where are, the, where are the people that can take our broken world and bring it to God today? And what would it take to do that? But Hezekiah managed to do that for, for Judah during that period. And Judah was a relatively small country. It's not the whole world, obviously. But Hezekiah managed to do that, and he was blessed by God, and Israel was blessed by God during his time. But Hezekiah died, of course, in 697 B.C., and he was succeeded for the next 57 years by two very evil kings, Manasseh and Ammon. And during that period, they went right back to all the stuff that, that Israel was doing, or that Judah was doing before Hezekiah, back to, um, to idolatry, um, back to taking God's temple and turning it into a temple to idols. Back into the probably the most abhorrent thing there is, child sacrifice. Um, Manasseh actually sacrificed some of his own children to idols during that period. Um, God is not happy about child sacrifice. That's one of his ultimate no-nos in the Bible is, uh, is child sacrifice. So for 57 years, Judah just went down the tubes, went you know, more and more and more and more evil. Eventually, God told Manasseh, and we covered this last week, I read you this passage last week, God finally told Manasseh, that's it, even after you're gone, I'm going to destroy Judah. And then, when, when King Hezekiah came in, Hezekiah was a good, I'm sorry, uh, King Josiah came next, after the two of them died, and King Josiah was a good king, and he tried hard to bring Judah back to God. And he did. He did a lot of reforms, but God wasn't willing to relent on what he had told uh, Manasseh. God still made it very clear to Josiah that, is, that Judah was still going to be destroyed in the near future. It was still coming. Judah had sinned so badly that God was going to execute judgment on them in the near future. And that, that had to make Josiah heart sick because he was trying so hard to bring the country back, but he couldn't. It was just so far gone at that point. And there's a lesson for us today, too, as we, as we look at that kind of thing. You know, we're talking about a nation here. And when we have good leadership, a nation thrives, as it did under Hezekiah. 
And we have bad leadership if it goes on long enough and long enough and long enough and long enough. Eventually, there's no coming back from it. And, and even though Josiah was a good king, he wasn't able to bring Judah back from that. And I think the lesson to us is, is we look at things in the world and we say, gosh, this is really going that way or going downhill or whatever. We need good leadership, and we need good leadership to, to bring us back to God, to a godly position. And if that's not happening in our world, eventually it's going to be too late, even if a good leader does show up. And that was kind of the lesson here. Josiah was a good leader, but he couldn't stop what was already underway and had been underway for so long. Now, it was during the age of Josiah that <coughs> Zephaniah wrote his book. Zephaniah, by the way, was a descendant of Hezekiah. Remember that from last week. So he was, he was of royal blood. So he was related, probably a, whatever, second cousin, a couple of times removed or something, uh, to Josiah. So he was probably in the court, probably advising Josiah. We're assuming that Zephaniah had a lot to do with getting Josiah to really repent and, and try to seek God and try to bring his country back during that period. But Zephaniah is written about 625 B.C. And uh, it's right, written right at the time when Josiah was in the process of trying to bring Israel back. And he succeeded to some extent, but ultimately he failed because God was not willing to forgive what had already happened. And that's an important thing for us to understand. There's, there is a point at which God just says, that's it, I'm done. You, know, you guys have done enough, and I realize you're trying to repent, but it may not be enough. Now, we're talking about a nation here, and I want to be clear on that. And in fact, I need to spend a few minutes talking with you about the whole concept of the Old Covenant. Very few people really get the Old Covenant unless you've really dug deep into some books like Deuteronomy and Leviticus, books that most of us don't spend a whole lot of time looking at. But the Old Covenant, Paul talks about <coughs> what Jesus did for us as being the New Covenant. That when Jesus died for us on the cross, he gave us a way as an individual. He gave each one of us a way to get to him forever. That's the new covenant. By, by shedding his blood for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, he gave us a way to get to him. All we have to do is accept that and confess our sins, and we're there. We're on our way to being with Jesus forever. That is the new covenant. Paul talked about it as the new covenant, and he related it to the old covenant. But I think, but, but Paul, being a, being a scribe, a Jewish scribe, fundamentally understood the Old Covenant, and I think it's easy for us to misunderstand the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is not individual, like the New Covenant is. The Old Covenant is national. It's, about, it's a national covenant of Israel with God. It was actually put together by God and given to the Jews at Mount Sinai, back in the time of Moses. And it's about God's relationship, not with each Jew as an individual, but with Israel as a nation. That's the old covenant. And what God said to Israel back at Mount Sinai was, all right, here's these 10 things, the 10 commandments. You must keep those. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Most of us know that that's, you know, if you want to you be successful in life, following the 10 commandments is a good way to do that. Um, he also gave them 635 other things that they had to do, um, and they have to, and these were very difficult, very challenging things. And there's probably, uh, to, to do 635 things every day for the rest of your life is difficult. There's probably never been a Jew who's ever lived, who's ever done them all. My guess is, with one exception, that's Jesus. Uh, but there's probably never been another Jew who's ever lived, who's ever done all of those. But that's what God wants us to do, or wants the Jews to do as individuals. But he really wanted Israel to do that as a country, as a nation. That was what the covenant was about. So the covenant said, even if you as an individual do these 635 things and do them perfectly for the rest of your life, which nobody can do, but even if you could do that, everybody else has to do it too. It's a national covenant. The Old Covenant, the way it's laid out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, is a national covenant. It's a covenant that the Jewish nation of, of Israel needs to do, and everyone needs to do it. And God said, you know, if you do all that, 
you will be your, you will be my people and I will be your God. That was the, the promise that he gave them back then. So it's important for us to understand that the Jews look at life differently or look at salvation differently than we do. We look at it as individuals. We look at it that, you know, we're under the new covenant. If we accept <laughs> Jesus, we can be saved. It's simple, it's straightforward. For the Jews, it's more about the nation. And as we get into some of this, we need to understand this. What's happening here is individual Jews might have still been coming to God during this period, during Josiah's period, but the nation couldn't completely come to God during that period. The nation could not live up to what God wanted. And the result was God was going to destroy the nation. Now, individuals were going to survive. There is a thing called the remnant in Israel. An individual remnant would survive this whole thing. Even, even in 586, when Jerusalem is destroyed, individuals would survive that, and they would go into Babylon, into captivity. But the nation itself was going to be destroyed, for at least for a while, at that point in time. So it's important for us to understand that about the... Uh, um, about the Old Covenant. The way Paul presents it, it's easy for us to assume that the Old Covenant is individual for Jews. It isn't. The Old Covenant is national for Jews. So let's... Um, I, I yeah. Could, this may not relate, but is that why, even like when they were dispersed all over, that that they maintained that yeah. their... Um, um, like their festivals and Absolutely. instead of assimilating is that why they're so um, God made it clear to the Jews back in Moses' time so that he didn't relate. want them to assimilate see we look we look at the world differently as Christians yeah. we look at the world that we are evangelists we want to bring Christ out to the world we want everybody to hear the good news about Christ <laughs> that's not what God told the Jews to do back at Mount Sinai what he told them to do is don't intermarry stick with your own people you know, stay, intermar stay married within your own people, raise your children in, in, in the one single God of Israel. And the reason was in those days, the rest of the world, the other 99% of the world was pagan. If you start intermarrying with pagans, just like Solomon did, right? If you start intermarrying with pagans, pretty soon you're going to destroy yourselves. So what God was trying to do was keep Israel <laughs> pure during that period. And Jews still think that way today. Jews still would prefer today, well, many to, to marry other Jews and to raise their children as Jews. Um, okay, yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's if why I'm, they're so driven to maintain their festivals, maintain their ethnic. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, instead of assimilating, I guess that's what I was. Right. After 4,000 years, the Jews are the, the most clearly identifiable people yes. on earth, and yet there are only 18 million Jews in the world today. <laughs> okay, out of 8 billion yeah. people on this planet. Okay. That's. A fraction of one percent, a tiny fraction of one percent. My math is right. It's about two tenths of one percent of the people in the world today are Jews. So they have done that. They have kept themselves pure, so to speak, over a long period of time by preserving their faith and by not intermarrying outside. And the ones who have intermarried outside have tended to drift away mm -hmm. and just get lost. It's the ones who have stayed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So God's still going to destroy <laughs> Judah. Unfortunately, Josiah didn't want to hear that, and neither did Zephaniah. Nobody wanted to hear that. But Zephaniah is out to tell them this is what God has said. Okay. So one more thing I want to cover as we dive into this. Zephaniah is talking about something that's about to happen 40 years in the future. Remember, he's writing about 625 B.C. That's when he's writing in 586 B.C., about 40 years later, Babylon is going to be destroyed by the Babylonian. I'm sorry, Babylon. Babylon is going to destroy Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians about 40 years later. So he's warning them that that's going to happen. That's the first time he's writing for. But he's also, as we go through here, 23 times he talks about the day of the Lord. Remember, the day of the Lord, we've covered this in all the classes I've ever taught, the day of the Lord is used 342 times in the Old Testament. And it's always referring to a period that hasn't occurred even now. It's the tribulation period that's coming. So he talks about 586 B.C., what's about to happen, but he also talks about the day of the Lord, which is in 2000 and something, we don't know when, but it's coming out in the future, which is a, an even worse tribulation that is coming. 
In addition to that, we'll see that Jesus, when he comes along in Matthew 24, adds into this a third tribulation period, and that is the tribulation period that will happen in 70 AD when the Romans come along and destroy Jerusalem. So as we go through all this today, bear in mind, Zephaniah is writing for two separate times, and eventually Jesus will add a third time into that as well. So he's, this is not just for Jew. you know, a lot of people look at the Old Testament and say, well, this is just about things that happened thousands of years ago. Why do I care? It's not about things that are happening thousands of years ago. It's about things that are about to happen soon. And, and that's why we should be caring. So, um, yeah, by the way, the day of the Lord uh, talks about the seven-year tribulation. That is first laid out in Daniel chapter 9. That's the first time we actually hear about that. So let's start in verse 4. Verse 4, I, this is God talking now. God talking through Zephaniah. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live on in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal, the names of the pagan and idolatrous priests. So God is saying, it's still going to happen. I'm still going to destroy Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm going to destroy Judah. Sorry, guys, Josiah's a good king, but not good enough. I'm still going to do it. And as I say, that helps us to understand that if we see our world going down, our country going down, we need to, get, we need to work to get good leaders in, godly leaders in, <laughs> because even a few godly leaders might not be enough to save things. So God wants godly leadership of a nation. This is about the nation again, the nation of Israel. God wants godly leadership of a nation. So at this point, it's about six, about 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, so God is warning them that it is definitely coming. It's not something that could be avoided at this point. It is definitely coming. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. And then he says, I will cut off, I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal. So God is going to destroy all of these idols. And in fact, when the Babylonians came in, they had different idols, but they did destroy all the idols that the Jews were worshiping in the temple in those days. So they destroyed all those idols when they came in. And then the names of the pagans and the idolatrous priests. So that's what God is talking about. Now let's continue on to verse 5. In verse 5, God says, Those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host... Those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech. So God is saying he's going he's to destroy a whole bunch of people here when he comes back. Anybody who goes up on the roof at night and worships the stars, worships the planets, worships the sun, worships the moon. There was a lot of that going on in the Middle East in those days. There's still a lot of that in various places around the world today. People who worship things in the heavens, things in the sky, the sun, the moon, whatever. Um, those people are going to be cut off and destroyed by God. God will destroy them. He did destroy them in Babylon. He will destroy them in the, during the tribulation. Remember, the, we're talking about the tribulation here as well. God will destroy people who worship all that other stuff. Money, by the way, is one of the things we see today, and fame and technology and some of the other things that people worship today. If you put those above God, God will destroy you during the tribulation. It's another thing that's coming. People who worship Baal. Baal was a, an evil god back in that time. People who worship Molech. Molech was an incredibly evil god who, who demanded the sacrifice of your children. You had to give your children to, Mo, to Molech. They had this weird thing. Molech had a fire, and they had this weird thing where you'd lay your child on this thing, and it would take them into the arms of Molech, which was dropping them into a fire. Um, your children would be, you know, Molech was just evil, evil, evil. Yeah. So God is going to destroy that kind of idolatry as well. But God's going to destroy the idolatry of our time as well. The idolatry of money and power and wealth and all the stuff that we see that people chase after in this world today that's not worth it. Verse 6, God says, Those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. So here we're talking about apostates, people who turn back, people who were following the Lord but no longer are. God 
God's going to destroy them. God is expecting people to stay with him. God is going to destroy them. Um, they abandoned the Lord. A lot of people in our world today are apostates. We see them all around us. God tells us he will destroy those who don't seek the Lord. I mentioned Deuteronomy 6.5 last week. Uh, I'm going to give you a different one. This is Deuteronomy 4.29. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your mind and all your soul. I read you Deuteronomy 6.5 last week, which said something very similar. It said if you, if you seek the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your... Or you must seek the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. So God wants us to seek him. That's why we're, that's why we're here on earth. God wants us to seek him. He wants us to make that connection with him. And uh, those who don't seek him will be destroyed. It's, it's not just a question of people who are pure evil, but people who don't seek the Lord will also be destroyed. It's clear all through the Bible. Jesus says it. It's clear in here in Zephaniah. It's clear back all the way back <coughs> in Deuteronomy, back in the olden first books of the Bible that, uh, that Moses gave to the Jews. Um, It says, nor inquire of him. So if, you know, there are a lot of people that just aren't curious. They just don't even ask the question, is, you know, is there, is, there, is there a God? And is he this God? And does he care? And all that stuff. Um, you know, there are people who just don't even bother to ask the question. Not good enough. Not asking the question isn't good enough. God will destroy those people as well. So God is really laying out here that if we want to be with him, <laughs> We need to be pursuing him. We need to be asking of him. We need to be, um, we need to know him. We need to be seeking him, just like it says in, in the Old Testament. Jesus goes on in a famous passage in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount and says, Ask and it will be given to you. Uh, this is Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. So Jesus picks up the same theme as well. He wants us to pursue him. God wants us to pursue him. That's one of the key reasons he put us here on earth, is to pursue him. How do we pursue him? Well, the best way is prayer. So there's a good place to start. God wants us to use earnest prayer. When you read Hosea, he says earnest is a key word. God wants our prayer to be earnest. So he wants us to pursue him with earnest prayer. Let me move on to verse 7 now. <clears throat> be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. So the Lord is saying the day of the Lord is near. Hmm. Now, a lot of people could say, well, gosh, it's only 40 years away, but this day of the Lord is near for us as well. Remember in Revelation, when we were studying Revelation, many times in there it says, and Revelation was written 2,000 years ago, it says this is near, it's coming soon. Words like near and coming soon are all over Revelation, right? It is near, it is coming soon. God's perception of soon and near might be a little different than ours, but it is coming and it is coming soon. So the day of the Lord, which is this part here, the tribulation, is also coming for us. And it is coming soon. And we need to be ready and get the world ready for that. So the day of the Lord, which is the day of the Lord's judgment, is near. The day of the Lord refers to a time of God's judgment for sin. So God's judgment for sin is coming. So... Here in Zephaniah's time, <clears throat> that judgment for sin is coming. It's only 40 years away. In our time, that judgment for sin is coming. We don't know when, but it's presumably getting closer, <coughs> closer and closer and closer as well for us. Um, the scriptures give us a whole lot of hints about that. They tell us that Israel will be here uh, when that happens. Well, Israel was established in, 19, <coughs> in 1948. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, verses 32 through 34, that Israel, the fig tree, will be flourishing and blooming and blossoming 
when it happens and that the people who see that happen will be there when this day of the Lord happens. Well, that's happening today. Israel is blooming and blossoming. I've been to Israel. The Israel has the best economy in the world today. And, and the Lord is incredibly blessing Israel over there. And it's happening. That, that is happening. So how close are we? We don't know, but we're getting closer and closer. Certainly we're closer today than we were yesterday. Uh, we're closer with each passing day. So the Lord had a plan for Jerusalem in 586 B.C. for tribulation there, and he has a plan for our world today for people who don't choose him. The Lord is, he prepared Judah and Jerusalem as a sacrifice here, he says. That's what he just talked about in this verse. He, Jerusalem and Judah are prepared as a sacrifice to him, but the Babylonians are going to be the people to execute that sacrifice. They are going to be the ones that are going to do that sacrifice to God. That's what Zephaniah just told us here. And God has, he uses an interesting word here. God has consecrated the Babylonians to do that. We think about consecrated as something to make you, to, to treat you in a very holy way, to make you very holy. Um, so God has given the Babylonians a holy duty to destroy Jerusalem and to destroy Judah. That's not the way we would normally think about it, but that's how God looks at it, right? He's, he's taken these pagan people and given them a holy duty. He's consecrated them, given them a holy duty to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. He's saying it right here in this verse. Let me read that again to you. Be silent before the Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice, that's Judah and Jerusalem. He has consecrated those he has, he has invited. That's the Babylonians. So God is consecrating the Babylonians to do this sacrifice to him of Judah and Jerusalem. Kind of an odd concept, but that's what Zephaniah is saying in this verse. So Zephaniah is giving us a different view of this. We look at this thing as just a great tragedy that Israel was destroyed. That's not how God looked at it. Israel was ready to be destroyed at that point, and, God, and God's judgment was coming upon Israel at that point. I'm sorry, I said Israel, it's Judah. Put the word Judah in where I just said Israel. Um, so, interestingly enough, this is where, you know, we talked about the ripening of the fig tree. That's in Matthew 24, verses 32 through 34. Jesus talks about the ripening of the fig tree, that Israel is going to ripen. First of all, Israel has to exist for that to happen. And that Israel is going to ripen and, and just develop into this beautiful, beautiful country, which is what it's doing today with this incredible economy. Some of the best high-tech industries in the world are in Israel. It's amazing some of the things that happen there. People fly into Israeli hospitals from all over the world for treatment for various things that they can't get treated for here. Uh, it's incredible just what's going on over there. So the Babylonians didn't realize they were consecrated by God to do this. They thought they were just being pagan crazies going in and killing people, but they were being consecrated by God to do that. They invited them, God invited them to feast on Judah and Jerusalem. Let me move on to verse 8. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes and the king's sons and all those clad in foreign, foreign clothes. So the people at the top of Israel that led Israel into all this sin, all this bad leadership, the princes, the kings, the king's sons, all these people who were wearing this extremely expensive clothes that they brought in from around the world, who were just showing extravagant wealth, all these people are going to be punished by God on the day of the Lord. And they were in 586 B.C. We know from what happened there. It's beyond this class today. But we know that the royal people were punished dearly during that period. Same thing is going to happen during the tribulation that's coming. We look at all the folks who are so consumed with getting their next billion or getting the next amount of clothes or getting 14 more homes in different countries around the world or whatever it is. That's not where God wants us focused. He wants us focused on him. Um, so let's move on to verse 9. On that day, again, he's talking about the day of the Lord now. On that day, he's also talking about the one that's about to come 40 years, so he's talking about both here. On that day, I will punish all those 
who avoid stepping on the threshold, who fill the temple of their gods with violence and deceit. Now he's obviously talking about pagans again here. God's going to punish people who have false gods. And the false gods today aren't the same gods they had in those days. The false gods today are money and power and all that stuff that, that we see around us today. God's going to punish those folks. Now what he's talking about here is a very specific scene that comes out of 1 Samuel 5. And in 1 Samuel 5, verses 1 through 5, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. And they brought it back and placed it in the temple of their false god, a god by the name of Dagon. And what happened, interestingly enough, was every morning God would destroy the statue of Dagon in the, in the temple. And when the, when the statue fell over, it fell on the threshold of the temple. So what did the people learn from that? Did they learn not to worship Dagon? No, they learned not to step on the threshold of the, of the temple when they walked in to worship Dagon. So the Philistines weren't, weren't the smartest people in the world. Um, but that's what they learned, was not to step on the threshold. So the, the Philistines, apparently in those days, did not step on the threshold of the temple as a result of that situation back in 1 Samuel. At least they were smart enough to send it back at one point. That's right. They sent it back because it was giving them hemorrhoids, right? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, right. All the people had hemorrhoids, so they sent it back and, and said, we can't deal with this anymore. Wow. God does have a sense of humor. Yes, he does. <laughs> um, now, it goes on to say that there is violence and deceit. And, you know, does anybody see any violence and deceit in our world today? We just talked about Ukraine earlier. How about deceit? You know, when was the last time you saw a news story you could really believe? And just totally God? believe is true. Um, violence and deceit is growing in our world today as we're approaching the period that's coming, just as violence and deceit was growing in Zephaniah's world and in Josiah's world back then. Um, it's very, very similar. What what Zephaniah was warning them about then is very similar to what we should be warning ourselves about today, what's happening today. This thing is not something that just happened 2,600 years ago. This is something that's happening today as well. Let's move on to, um, to verse 10. God tells us, On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter and a loud crash from the hills. Now, the fish gate and the new quarter were sections of Jerusalem in those days. I'm not going to get into a map of Jerusalem as it looked in those days, but these were parts of Jerusalem. So what, what Zephaniah is saying is that a cry is going to go up all around Jerusalem. All the different parts of Jerusalem are going to be in wailing and in mourning because the Babylonians are going to come in and they're not going to be nice people when they come in. They're going to be killing people. They're going to be doing all sorts of destruction, raping, pillaging, everything, and it's going to be awful when they come in. That's what it's going to be like. By the way, it's going to be like that during the tribulation that's coming here for us as well, for, for those of us that don't choose it here. So a cry is going to go up, and it's going to be a you know, cry from, from, that, from Jerusalem in that period. A time, a time of great pain is coming on Jerusalem, and it's coming on our world today. Let's move on to verse 11. Verse 11, it says, Wail, you who live in the market district, all your merchants will be wiped out. All who trade with silver will be ruined. Um, there should be a closed quote there, by the way. I didn't close the quote, so sorry about that. But basically, there's going to be a lot of wailing. There was a lot of wailing in Jerusalem at that point. Jeremiah tells us that story. If you read Jeremiah's story of what happened when, when Babylon actually, or when Jerusalem actually fell to the Babylonians, huge, huge horrible day of death and destruction. There'll be a lot of wailing in that day. People who live in the market district, people who've invested their lives in commerce and money and power are all of a sudden going to find poof, it's gone. It's the, the, you know, if you have any money, they're going to take it. And if you, and what money you have that's the company of the king's money, it doesn't matter. It's going to be worthless because the country won't be there anymore. It happens all the time when countries get conquered, their money becomes worthless, other than their gold, and their gold gets taken. So that's all that stuff doesn't do people any good. That's what's going on here. So the wailing in, uh, in 586 was God's judgment for sin falling on, on Jerusalem. 
and God's judgment for sin is going to fall on the world in the tribulation. That's part of what's being forecast here as well. Verse 12, at that time I, this would be God now, at that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like the wine left on its dregs, who think, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. So there are lots of folks out there that just think, hey, this God stuff, God, you know, he doesn't really do anything. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't, you know, how, how come this kid died over here? Where was God when this kid was dying? This God doesn't really do anything. Well, this God is about to do something. This God is about to punish Jerusalem and Judah in a few years at this point in time. And he's about to punish this world at some point in the near future. It says God says he will go about with lamps. In other words, he will shine his light everywhere and find everyone. And he's looking for those who are complacent, those who just think, hey, God, no big deal, right? I don't have to worry about him. He hasn't shown himself in a long time. Yeah, why do I think he's going to come back and bother me, right? Why should I worry about it? Well, here it is. You know, God's going to punish people who are complacent. Um, people who think the Lord will either do nothing, either good or bad. Mm. You know, how, how many times have you heard somebody say, the Lord didn't do anything to help my child when he died, or the Lord didn't, you know, we've all seen that so many times. You know, there are people who think that, <coughs> that the Lord will do nothing. He won't. The Lord will do something. It's coming. It happened for them. It's going to happen for us as well. Mm. The Lord will be there to help or to punish whatever he and his perfect plan thinks is the correct thing, but he will do it. Verse 13, this is God still speaking. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. They will build houses but not live in them. They will plant vineyards but not drink the wine. <coughs> so people are going to think, well, gosh, I've got all this nice stuff. I've got this beautiful house. I've got all this land, this property, these vineyards. You know, I've got 14 houses around the world. I've got jet planes, whatever I've got. You know, today is a little different, obviously, but I think we're talking about the same kind of stuff as what he's talking about there. People who have material wealth are all going to find that it's all going to be plundered. It's going to be gone. The Babylonians did that in 586 B.C. You better believe the Antichrist's people are going to be doing that in the near future. Whatever you have that you think is of value won't be of value because it'll be gone. You know, people who live for money and who live for riches and live for creature comforts, they're going to suffer dearly it just, in, just in, in the coming tribulation, just as they did in 586 B.C. That money is going to be of no value to them. They're going to lose it. It'll be taken from them or it'll be turned into worthless pieces of paper. Um, they won't be able to enjoy it. They won't be able to enjoy their homes. They won't be able to enjoy the fruit of their land like wine here or whatever it is whatever they grow they won't be able to enjoy all these villas that they own around the world now in verse 14 we get into a slightly different part of this god is now changing his thing and he's very he's very more clearly talking about the future more than he was up until now so let me read you verse 14 again this is god still talking to zephaniah the great day of the Lord, that's the tribulation, is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter, the shouting of the warriors there. So the day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord, is near and it's near and coming quickly. That was true in, in Zephaniah's time, it was about to happen. It's true in our time, it's about to happen. The great day of the Lord is coming, coming soon. I mean, God, listen to how God says that the great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly, listen, exclamation point. God's trying to get our attention, right, with this, with this verse. He wants our attention drawn to the fact that he's about to do something. He's about to do something today as well. And then he goes on to say, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter, the shouting of the warriors there. So again, there's going to be a lot of crying, a lot of pain on that day. And there'll be warriors around, people, you know, people with guns and whatever else running around doing stuff that, that's going to be evil. So he's warning us in our time about it as well. Now, interestingly enough, there's a third time now that I, that I said I would introduce to you later 
that we start to get into here. And that is this time that Jesus warns us about in Matthew 24, verse um, 27. Jesus warns us about the time in 70 AD when the same thing was going to happen, when the Romans were going to come and destroy Jerusalem. So now, Zephaniah up till now has been talking about two times, our, his time and our time. He's now adding a third time into that. And if you read, what, if you read that passage in Matthew 24, you're going to see that Jesus is talking about almost exactly the same thing that Zephaniah was talking about, a coming destruction of Jerusalem and of, Ju and of Judah. That's about to happen. Again, about 40 years in the future. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. 30 AD, Jesus is talking about a destruction coming 40 years in the future, and it happens in 70 AD. 625 BC, he's talking about something that's going to happen 40 years in the future, and it happens in 586 BC, almost 40 years in the future. Interesting, right? How those two connect. How Jesus' prediction in Matthew 24 of a whole different time and a whole different problem is very similar to the one that Zephaniah is talking mm -hmm. about here. So all three of these are going to be extremely bitter for Judah, extremely bitter for Jerusalem. Enemy warriors are going to be operating inside Jerusalem. Let's move on to verse 15. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Sounds like a good day, right? We don't like to be there for that one, wouldn't we? So God's telling us, you know, the day in 586 was like that. It was awful. Jeremiah tells us about that. The day in, in 70 AD was like that. It was awful. Um, I can't remember his name now. There was a Jewish writer who wrote about that day. Um, his name is escaping me right now. Again, awful, awful day. And the seven-year tribulation period is going to be like that, the one that's coming. It's going to be a day of great anguish, great distress, uh, great trouble, great ruin, great darkness, great gloom, great clouds, great blackness. Uh, Jesus, and again, in Matthew 24, a couple of verses later, Matthew 24, verse 29 says, listen to how Jesus talks about the one that's coming in his time, 40, day, 40 years later. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So Jesus is talking about the one that's coming at 70 AD, but he's also talking about the one that's yet to come as well. So here we see the same kind of thing from Zephaniah that Jesus talks about. Verse 16, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. Now, Jerusalem was well fortified in those days. It had big walls, it had a lot of troops around it, but not nearly enough troops to protect the city from the Babylonian hordes that were, that were surrounding it and that were starving the city out. So all this, all this stuff that they built for defense didn't work. It didn't stop the Babylonians. The Babylonians ultimately got through. The same thing's true. All the things we think we're building that are going to protect us if things go bad in the world, they're not going to work. Nope. The only thing that's going to protect us is connecting with God. Uh, Jeremiah actually uses almost exactly these same words five different times. Uh, Jeremiah 4.5, Jeremiah 5.17, Jeremiah 8.14, Jeremiah 34.7, and Jeremiah 48.18. He talks about that day when Babylon comes and Jerusalem falls, and he talks about how horrible that day is. Much of the book of Jeremiah is about that day and the day that Jerusalem falls. And the walls aren't going to stop them. Um, interestingly enough, there is one difference in this. At the end of the tribulation, the walls will fall, but Jesus will then destroy the invaders. So that one is a little bit different than these other two. And the other two, the invaders triumphed for quite a while. They won't triumph at the end of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, God says, I will bring distress on the people and they will walk like blind men because they have <coughs> sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like filth. There's another lovely scene, right? <laughs> so, He's going to bring great distress on the people living in Jerusalem and in Judah. They're going to wander around like blind men, like, what is happening to my world, right? They're going to wonder, what is going on in my world? That happened in 586 B.C. Jeremiah tells us that. It's 
going to happen in our time or in, in the time yet to come in the day of the Lord in the tribulation people are going to say what, what's going on in the world what is going on how come everything's falling apart what's with all these earthquakes and these floods and seas turning into blood and all this other stuff what is going on here people will walk around like blind men like they don't know what's going on hmm. and they won't realize that it's because they have sinned against the Lord the only way you're going to get into the tribulation is if you've sinned against the Lord, if you've made the decision not to accept him. Then it goes on to say their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like filth. Hmm. That's a lovely scene. Pretty graphic description of what it's going to be like during that period that's yet to come and also what it was, what it was like back in 586 B.C. and also what it was like in 70 A.D. Let's go to the last verse now, verse 18. God tells us neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on earth. This one is clearly about the one yet to come, okay? This is clearly, this is not what happened in 586 B.C. This verse is about the one that is yet to come. So it's clear that he's talking here about that. So he says, neither their silver nor their gold will save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. We've talked about that. All the money in the world, you could be a trillionaire, doesn't matter. If Jesus comes back for you and the tribulation comes, it's, you know, you're done. Um, the Lord's wrath is not going to stop because of silver or gold. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed. That is the tribulation. And that is also the period right after the tribulation when God ends the world, as we know it brings and brings gets rid of the world as it exists today and brings in the new heaven and the new earth. So again, this is all now we're now into the future period, a period even for us in the future. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on earth. So that's now at the very end of the tribulation period the end of the thousand year reign when um, the world will cease to exist as we know it and it will be replaced by the new heaven and the new earth. This is at the end of the thousand year reign now. So people who choose sin over God are going to be disappointed. Their money is going to be worthless. Nothing is going to save them from the Lord's wrath except seeking him. That's the only thing that will save them from the Lord's wrath. The Lord's jealous for his people and his people are Israel the Lord is jealous for Israel. It's very clear throughout the scriptures. The Lord is jealous for Israel. By the way, that's still true today. The Lord is jealous for Israel. The Lord will not tolerate people messing with Israel beyond a certain point. We see it consistently. We're going to continue to see it. Israel will never be destroyed. God has promised that. A lot of people are out there trying to destroy Israel. It isn't going to happen. God will destroy people who do not belong to him. His jealousy for Israel is extreme. We've seen that all throughout the Bible. God is extremely jealous for Israel, and he will destroy anybody who tries to destroy Israel. And at the end of the tribulation, as I said, all sin and all sinners on earth will be ended by God. So we've been pretty black this week talking about the tribulation and talking about what happened in 586 B.C. Next week, we're going to get into or next, next week, two weeks, we're going to get into the beginning of chapter 2 where we see that there is redemption. Mm. Tune in. Redemption is coming. <laughs> Any questions uh, for today? Class? I got you done two minutes early. I'm getting the hook back there. So um, thank you, and we'll see you all in two weeks. But please come back next week for Pastor Dean's class. <laughs> <laughs>